I think we're live. I hope it's working. Hello, everybody. Uh, if somebody could comment in the chat and let us know if this is working, then we will get started. Sorry for the delay. Uh, YouTube would not let us join the, uh, the, the webinar that we had scheduled. I tried everything uh, trying to get it to work. So hopefully uh, y'all are able to kind of automatically find us over on this live stream. So I'm going to wait confirmation from Carrie that this is actually working before I do anything else. I see you um, now, but we still have a lot of people over on the other side that are... Okay. Can you hear me? Is that working? Um, yep. Cool. Awesome. So we're going to hang out just for a little bit and give everybody some time to make it over to this live stream from the other one. Thank you, everyone, for your patience. Sorry about this. Uh, we tried to be good by scheduling it, and then that ended up making it harder for us. So. <laughs> Um, well, we got it figured out now, though, so, we're, sort of. Yeah, it's kind of working. <laughs> Let me adjust a few things here. Alright, I uh, I cannot see the chat at all, so I you're going to have to tell me when yeah. to start. I'm, uh, I'm Carrie, I'm over here on the side, I'm sitting next to Dale, you just can't see me. So. Carrie Cam. Oh, hi. <laughs> So I have it pulled up over here, so. Oh, when I plugged in this other monitor, it adjusted all my screen sizes. That was convenient. <laughs> okay. There, now it's back to what it was. All right, how are we looking? People made it over yet? <clears throat> All right, so I'm gonna go ahead and start. Um, so, hey everyone, my name is Del Spoonmore. Uh, again, this is Carrie, and we are the creators of this app. Uh, we are the initial creators. We have some friends that help us with it now, Justin and Patrick. Big shout out to them that uh, they were crucial in building out the Garden Plus stuff. But, um, but this is you know it's just us. We're not some big company. We're not uh, out trying to make money off of this necessarily. This is just a passion project for us. So, if you uh, if you haven't met us yet. Hey, uh, I'm Dale, and um, so anyway, we're going to talk about how to start growing food, and, and to start off, I want to show our garden and kind of talk about why we started growing food. So this tab that we have here, this Who We Are tab here, um, has, uh, this is our family here, so we have, we have four kids, we, we're in Oklahoma City, and this is our garden here. So when we first started growing food, um, if you go to our website at seedtospoon.net, you can see a, a bigger picture of this, but... This was our yard when we first started. And we started growing food really, um, number one, because we were trying to get our health in order. Uh, this was like 2015. Um, Carrie and I had just met the, the, a couple years before and we had just bought this house. And when we bought the house, we wanted to, uh, we wanted to start growing food because we had started trying to eat healthier and we started eating a lot of spinach and kale and oregano and, and all this stuff that we had read about that would help with um, with, with anxiety and depression. That was uh, the reason why we first started because I've, I've had issues with anxiety and depression my entire life. And I found this book called The Depression Cure that talked about how growing your own food and drinking a lot of water and uh, being mindful and getting a lot of sunlight and doing all these things would help. So, um, so we started buying a lot of kale, spinach, oregano, all that kind of stuff, and it started to get pretty expensive. And that was where the idea started for us, where, um, you know, we, we decided we wanted to try a garden. So we started with square foot gardening, and I'm gonna, let me jump to a section of the app to show you what that is. I'm just going to jump into a random plant here. We'll get into all this here in a second, but I want to jump to the square foot gardening here. So square foot gardening is what we started with because... I mean, honestly, it was probably just the first gardening book I saw, but I, I, I really liked the way that he presented information. When I say he, it's Mel Bartholomew. He's the creator of this, and he was a, an engineer and came into gardening from engineering and designed this whole system that was more efficient than the standard, like, row gardening methods and, and the ways that, you know, had been grown, that the people had grown food before. And something about it just really clicked with me, and I really liked it. So... The square foot gardening method is what we started with, and I'm going to jump back over to uh, to here to show our garden again. And so we had a couple of of, of little like raised beds, you know, and um, 
and we and we started off small that that first year, and, and then it kind of uh, okay, and then it kind of quickly took over, and, and now this is this is basically what our yard looks like now. So um, so yeah, so we're we're gonna talk all about how to do this with your yard, or to do something smaller like on a patio or or something like that. Uh, but just how to start growing food in general, because we built this app after uh, doing this and going through like you know master gardener courses and. Uh, reading countless number of books and, and taking online courses and just doing everything we could trying to learn how to grow food uh, I get obsessed with things uh, I'm on the spectrum and this is kind of my, my thing I just love to research things and uh, so gardening has been my thing for the past five years now that I've been obsessively researching and everything that we've learned has gone into this app so uh, if, you're, if you're not familiar with our app already this is the from seed to spoon app you can find it on iOS or on Android we also have a web app, that's what I'm showing right now. So this is actually app.cdespoon.net that works from any device, like a Kindle or something like that, uh, that doesn't have the, the app store or just from your, your laptop or, or wherever. So um, we have over a hundred different plants in this app that, um, and each, each plant that you tap on is gonna walk you through everything you need to know about how to grow it. So we're gonna go in detail on plants, but I kind of just wanna walk through kind of at a high level um, kind of what you do to get started. So we're going to use this app to drive this presentation, basically. And everything that I'm going to show you is, is, is in this app, and you can go back to it and get to it. So we're going to start with this Articles tab down here in the bottom right, and this Getting Started tab. And also, I want to mention, if you have questions, um, throw them in the chat. Carrie is going to be uh, helping out with questions. We have a lot of blog posts that cover a lot of these different things and she'll be sending links to, to that and, and all that kind of stuff. So this getting started tab is meant for anybody that is new to growing food, that is just starting out. So this this blog post here, this how to start growing your own food in four easy steps is a really good uh, introduction to how to start. So I'm kind of scroll through here and I'm going to use this to kind of uh, guide kind of the first steps. So if you if you want to start growing food and you have a yard already um, and it's a Bermuda grass yard then you could just dig that Bermuda grass up and plant in its place but it is a pain in the butt because Bermuda grass is very difficult to get rid of if you cut it then it basically makes two new plants from where you cut it and it's just it's very difficult so what we decided from from early on was to follow some of the back to Eden gardening principles which basically are this, you cover the, the grass with cardboard and then a thick layer of wood chips, like a foot of wood chips basically. And that's basically what we did. We just started covering our entire yard with cardboard. One thing I wanna mention there is the bigger the cardboard box, the easier it's gonna be. If you just put a bunch of Amazon boxes down and then a big windstorm comes up or something, then it's a pretty frustrating experience. So try and find like big boxes if you're not sure where to find something like that, I don't know where you'd find something like that right now with everything going on, but before we would go to like uh, any kind of small local place that dealt with really big equipment. So like air conditioner repair, I, I, I can't even think right now. It was Harley Davidson store for a while, but they stopped. Um, but just try and think of a place that gets really big boxes in and it makes it a lot easier. And basically we just went through and covered our entire yard with cardboard and then wood chips we get for free. So if you are in Oklahoma, then you can go to the, down in Norman, the, the Cleveland County, um, uh, what's it called? The Cleveland County? Extension office? No, not the extension office. It's just the compost facility. If you Google compost facility, you'll be able to find it. So you go down there and they have a giant pile of wood chips that are, it's created from all the trees that arborists and just landscaping companies bring in and then drop off there. And they run them through a giant chipper and they have a specific pile that is really nice generally like the they you know that works really well for mulch and we go down there and get a truckload of wood chips i mean we, when we were starting out i was going down twice a week and getting a truckload of wood chips basically and we were just hauling them from the back of the truck to the garden and then dumping them on top of the cardboard and what's happened now is wherever we had the cardboard and the wood chips it's all decomposed now and we have incredible soil there now. So we're able to plant directly in that area. And then uh, we're doing that with like perennial stuff like trees and bushes and herbs and things like that. But 
when we started back then, we built raised beds on top of them. And our raised beds basically look like this right here. And um, and there, it's a, it's a real simple construction. You just cut some, you know, cut some wood and and, and make a box out of it. Um, the one thing that we've run into with these is they fall apart in a hurry. It seems so. Um, a couple of ours have, have completely fallen apart on us. Um, and and about a year into our gardening journey, we discovered these smart pots and really haven't looked back from using those. So we'll talk more about those here in a second, but. Um, the basic idea is that you're going to be building these raised beds or putting the smart pots on top of the cardboard and the wood chips and then as all that breaks down you have these raised beds and then the next year or the year after that now you start to kind of plant around and it's just this, like, kind of this whole system so whenever you're starting out with the raised beds um i've talked about the boxes um let's let's go ahead and talk about smart pots now so these smart pots are fabric raised beds they are made out of this like super high quality felt type material that lasts a long time and it's breathable which is the big thing about them. So here on the sides, um, oxygen is able to come into the smart pot from here, whereas opposed on these wooden raised beds, oxygen is not able to come in. And the reason why that's important is because plants are kind of like cars. What I mean by that is the more oxygen and the more gas, if you will, that you funnel into the plant, the faster and the, and the healthier, it, the, the better the plant's gonna go. Um, it's kind of like a car where if you have a, a high, in, a high like, um, uh, you know, you're injecting um, fuel and, and, and extra oxygen into the motor like it's, a, you know, um, I forget the name of it. I'm not, I'm not a car, I'm not a super car person, but you get the idea. Um, it's the same thing with plants. So with, with plants, their gas is, is water and nitrogen. So um, they're able to get extra oxygen through the sides. And, and we've, ha and we've had a, a number of plants that we've, we've grown side by side with a smart pot next to one of these wooden raised beds. And we have seen remarkable differences. Um, Another thing that we really like about these smart pots is it makes it easier to water in the summer whenever it gets really hot. So we have a lot of these smaller smart smart pots that are like 15, 20 gallons. And what we'll do is put those inside of a kiddie pool and then fill the kiddie pool with like two inches of water. And then it'll drink water from below. Now, one caveat is that you do not want to leave the, the smart pot in water all the time because the roots do need to dry out. Um, so, um, okay, sorry, something distracted me for a second. So the roots do need to dry out. Um, you're gonna have issues with root rot and pests and all sorts of things if you, uh, if, if you don't, if you, if you don't uh, take them out of the smart pot from time to time. So, or out of the, out of the kiddie pool from time to time. Okay, so um, once you've decided whether or not you're gonna go with the wooden raised bed or the smart pot, um, the next big decision or the next big thing you need to do is to fill um, them with a soil mix. So um, with square foot gardening, you're not going to just grow in straight soil, like just like your clay or whatever you have it in the backyard. You're going to want to make a higher quality soil mix because you're going to be planting uh, pretty dense and you have to have adequate nutrients for all the plants to be able to, to use. So um, the, the, the soil mix that they recommend in the book that is pretty standard as far as soil mixes go is really easy to make. And you basically just mix together these three ingredients. So the first ingredient is peat moss. You can also substitute coconut core instead. We've had good success with that. Um, it's more sustainable, coconut core is. Peat moss is, a, is not a renewable resource. So we, we've tried to get away from using that. but. Um, if you're having a hard time finding coconut core right now, then it's okay to use peat moss instead. Um, we get this, uh, the peat moss in bags from like Home Depot or something like that for about $12 a bag. The vermiculite, um, this is a coarse rock that is heated until it explodes and basically makes like a popcorn type structure. And it absorbs water really, really well. And that's the key benefit of it. It helps regulate moisture in the soil. And then... Uh, so the, the vermiculite, we get that at uh, nurseries primarily. So uh, if you're in Oklahoma City, I think TLC has the cheapest price last time I saw, uh, about $30 a bag for, uh, for a big bag. Make sure you do not buy this at a, a big box store because the, the cheapest prices on these are going to be at a nursery in bulk. Uh, the, cheap, uh, the smallest bag you want to get is the, is the four cubic foot because it's just really not worth it to buy the smaller bags. Um, and then the next ingredient and the most important ingredient is compost. So compost is the main thing that your plants eat. That's their primary food source. 
And for that reason, it's best to have a variety of compost sources that you mix together. So think about this for a second. Like if you, uh, if you were to eat the exact same thing every single day, you're probably going to end up sick because you're missing some sort of nutrient because you can't get all the nutrients from eating the same thing. Well, it's kind of the same way with plants where um, your compost source for the plants needs to come from a variety of places. So I mean things like vegetable sources where you're making compost just from your vegetable scraps, uh, worm castings. We have a worm farm that our four-year-old loves to manage. Uh, I think we have a video or something that talks mm -hmm. about worm farming. Um, we have a compost bin outside that we make uh, compost from. We have a composting guide that goes into detail on all this, so we'll post this down, that down in the chat. Um, but really, like when you're starting out, it takes a while to make compost and you want to get started now, so I recommend buying compost in bulk. If you're in Oklahoma City, then I recommend Minute Materials. Uh, I'm not paid by them or anything like that. I just, I've tried all the different places around here and I really like what they have. And they have a lot of variety as well. They have a vegetable compost, they have a manure-based compost, they have more of a hybrid compost. They also have a compost that comes from the zoo, from like elephants and stuff like that. So um, typically what we do is we go and just get like a third of a scoop or a fourth of a scoop of each of the compost that they have and just have them dump a little bit in the back of my truck. And then when we unload, we just kind of mix it. So basically what you do is you mix all of this stuff together. We've got a video here that shows kind of a, a hack on a way that you can mix it together easily. These compost tumblers here, um, you can find them at like, I, I see them at like Sam's Club and Walmart and places like that all the time. And they're terrible for making compost, but they're great for mixing soil. So uh, we always seem to find them on Facebook Marketplace or Craigslist or something like that pretty cheap because people find out they don't really, really work that well for compost and then get rid of them. But they're great for mixing soil. So you just dump in a bucket of each one of these and then start mixing it around and then dump it. and. That's basically all there is to it. You can also mix it on a tarp. Um, that's not too bad. Or if you're filling a smart pot, it's easy enough just to dump a bucket of each ingredient directly into the smart pot and then just mix. Um, especially if you've got four kids like I do, they are very good at mixing all this. I do want to mention that the vermiculite though, you do not want the kids to be messing with that if it's dry in any way, shape or form. You want to get it completely saturated with water and all mixed in before the kids are, are dealing with that because it can kind of come up in the air and get in their lungs and stuff like that. So I did want to mention that on the vermiculite. Typically we're having the kids mix like uh, the coconut core and the compost together and, um, and that kind of stuff. Um, okay, so uh, store-bought soil mix. You can buy soil mix from the store. You're gonna spend a lot of money though. Um, I don't really recommend doing that. Uh, I, it's, uh, you now what has come along recently, especially in Oklahoma, I think for obvious reasons, is you can buy a uh, soil mix, high quality soil mix in bulk now. Um, pretty much every place that sells soil sells like this stuff in bulk now. So um, I'm, I think Minic does too. I know Minic does too. Um, but they gave us some to try last year, and it was good stuff. So um, that might be an option to save some money, um, depending on what state you're in. Just call like your local bulk, bulk soil or nursery center, you know, place like that. Um, okay, so now the last step, once you have it, your raised bed or, or whatever you wanna grow in filled, is to figure out what you wanna grow. And this is where our app comes back into play. So, um, on this Getting Started tab, we have more articles here, you know, that go into more stuff. I'm gonna, I'm gonna get away from this and come back over into plants now and show how our app makes it easy to know what you wanna grow. So I mentioned earlier that whenever we started growing food, it was because we wanted to find uh, ways that we could help with anxiety and depression naturally without taking medication. So uh, Carrie is a nurse and um, she started studying and, and looking up, you know, the different plants that we could add into our diet to help. And that's basically where the idea for this feature come from, comes from. So this growing for health feature that we have up here lets you scroll through 26 different health related reasons for growing, meaning these are all reasons why you would potentially want to grow food for your health. So uh, scroll through the list. I'm going to go ahead and choose mental health. And then now it's going to show you all of the plants that help or assist with mental health. So it gives you an idea of where you can start uh, in, in your journey to grow, to grow food. So uh, from here, the next you know consideration is, well, what can I plant now? Like what's in season? And from there you can come in here and then filter by can be planted. 
So now this is going to show you everything that is for mental health that can be planted right now where you live. So if you scroll through here, you're going to see a lot of plants. Now, you're going to see plants on here that, uh, like avocado. Avocado you can grow in Oklahoma, but there's considerations you have to make. You have to move it indoors in the winter. So if you tap on avocado, you're going to read that here. And then down here, you're going to see that frost tolerance is it only tolerates a light frost. So anything below that, you've got to bring it indoors. So you, you may see some things in here that you think, well, I can't grow that where I live. Well, um, true, traditionally you can't if you plant it in the ground, but using these smart pots and doing things like that makes it really easy just to move them in and out. So we have a lime tree, a lemon tree, an orange tree that we just move in and out uh, in the winter and then you know put it back out whenever we have nice days. So um, scrolling through the list, you can see we have a lot of plants in here, but filtering down this way helps give you an idea of where to start. So... All right, so let's go ahead and jump in and start talking about how to grow some specific plants. And then in doing so, we'll talk about some of the, the ideas around growing food and some of the concepts that you need to know. So let's start with uh, spinach. Spinach is my favorite thing to grow. Um, it's probably one of the things that when we first started growing food, it was like I had one of these aha moments with it where um, before we grew spinach, I knew of spinach as something that like was in this can that was in my pantry that my mom had that we never ever opened. I think my entire life it was just like the stuff that Popeye was on it and that was like really all I knew about it until I started eating like Subway I guess as like a teenager and I started adding uh, spinach on, on the sandwich just to feel like I was doing something productive with my health but I never really like liked the way it tasted or thought anything about it but the first time that we ate spinach out of the garden it, it kind of changed things because it tasted way different than anything I'd ever had before. Um, and it was like cool and crisp and it had, and, and I had a couple different varieties and they each had their own flavor. And it was just this moment where I was like, this, this is something. And, and what I soon realized was that with that added taste that I was, you know, that I was tasting came a bunch of added nutrition and suddenly my anxiety, my depression was, was, was way better. And, and that's still the way it works today where if I don't spend enough time in the garden and if I don't eat enough stuff out of the garden then it it tends to come back so so anyway I'm a big fan of spinach for those reasons um, when you tap on the plant and you go into it we have this uh, bar at the top that shows you all the other health things that uh, this plant has so if you tap on it then it'll uh, it'll show you what that means so you know this one is about Lyme disease here um, at this very top here we have a description that shows you um, how or it talks about this is really just kind of our uh, summary of why you should care about that plant um, you know it's kind of talking about you know various things that we kind of throw in that one now here is where we show you planting dates and these planting dates are calculated for where you live and the way that we do that is we have a database of every weather station in the United States and we have about the, the last hundred years worth of freeze data for that weather station so what we do is we match you up to your nearest weather station and then we look at the historical averages of when it typically freezes and then we use that to, to calculate when to plant. So I will say that right now uh, it is inaccurate for Oklahoma because we just had snow in Oklahoma on April, whatever this is, April 13th, 14th, I don't know, I've lost track of days. I think we're, everybody's lost track of days. We're somewhere in April, I'm pretty sure. I think we're about halfway through April. I think I gotta learn about tax day or something. So I think we're 14, <laughs> something like that. Um, so, um, so yeah, so take that with a grain of salt that, you know, you, if, if, the, if it says a date, but you look outside and there's snow on the ground, then don't put your tomatoes in the ground, please. Um, I don't want to be the cause of all these dead tomatoes. So please. <laughs> um, and we, we, this is one of those areas that we want to get better at. So we've been, uh, if I guess this is a chance to show Garden Plus. So I don't think it's going to work because I'm not on, one second. It's my work. There we go. Okay. So um, this is the, the the preview of Garden Plus. So this is what we're wanting to start incorporating is using your actual weather data to help guide planting decisions. So we are early in that process. Uh, this is what we have so far. We're going to have next our alerts. So right now, if you go into here, you can see that there's a frost prediction, but we need to send you a push notification telling you. So that's next on our list. Um, we'll get into what everything we're doing here soon uh, once we get a little deeper into this but okay so let's come back into spinach and get back to where we were so what this does is it calculates planting dates 
based on where you are. If you want to change any of this information, so if you do not agree with what we've uh, estimated, you can come in here and you can set your own custom prostates and then it'll recalculate for you. So, um, all right, so let's come back into here. All right, so now if we continue scrolling down, it's gonna tell you whether or not it can be planted in the summer. Um, some plants do not tolerate heat at all. Some really like, uh, like heat, so they continue to grow fine, like basil and okra or like that. Um, and then fall planting dates. A lot of people don't realize that fall is a great time to grow food. Um, in Oklahoma, it's a better time to grow food than spring because there's not near as many pests. Uh, the, the weather is more temperate. Um, and really, it doesn't get that cold here until like December. Sometimes we'll get a freak storm in November. But um, we had tomatoes on Thanksgiving a couple years ago. So um, here we have all the information or more information about that plant. So we have the growing season, which is cool. If you tap on this little question mark on the card, it'll come up and give you more information about it. And then it'll link to a blog post that has even more information about it. So um, when you start getting into growing food, you're going to see that you've kind of got three different categories of plants. You've got plants that like to grow in the, in the cool weather. You've got plants that like to grow in warm weather. And then you've got plants that come back year after year that are called perennial. So that's what we have here in a growing season. You'll see cool, warm, or perennial. Um, for frost tolerance, um, this is what that plant can tolerate as far as cold is concerned. So survives hard freeze. Uh, spinach can, t can tolerate freezes uh, very cold. So what I mean by that is we plant our spinach typically in the, in the fall, in October and November, and then it overwinters and then comes back really strong in the spring and does great. Kale is the same way. Kale comes from Russia, so it laughs at our winters in Oklahoma and doesn't care about them. Uh, it just goes dormant there for like a month or two and then comes back strong and you get a ton of leaves from it. So that's what frost tolerance is. Uh, every plant's going to be different on that. Um, you'll see some that say, you know, only tolerates a light frost and have the temperature that it can handle there. So number per square. Uh, we've talked about this a little bit with square foot gardening, but let's kind of dive in a little bit more now. So number per square refers to how many seeds of that plant or transplants of that plant can be planted per square. And what I mean by square is square foot gardening took the idea of taking like a 32 square foot raised bed and dividing that into 32 equal squares. And then each square is planted independently of the square next to it. And you think of it as its own little mini garden, if you will. So spinach is nine per square. Uh, carrots are 16 per square. Um, tomatoes are one per square. Broccoli are, is one per two squares. So if you see 0.5 in there, that, that means one per two squares. We're trying to figure out the best way to represent that. We'll, we'll work on that part. Um, but that's basically what the number per square means. And then this seeding square here makes it really easy if you're OCD like me to get everything spaced just perfectly. Um, we sell these in our store. Um, they're really handy. And also it's nice if you have kids because this is how we taught our kids uh, colors and numbers and all sorts of stuff. So um, these things are awesome. And then the square foot gardening book, uh, that's definitely worth checking out as well. Um, okay, so container size. This is the size of Smart Pot that is the right size for, for that plant. So if you tap on it, you can see all the different sizes. We have a, an easy uh, shortcut right here that is for that size. So if you want to grow in a Smart Pot, this is the right size for that plant. Um, sprout to Harvest. This is how long it takes for um, that plant to produce food from the time it first sprouts. So you've got to add in how long it takes to germinate as well, which is the field that we have down here, this days to sprout. So you got you to factor that in. And that's one of the ways that Garden Plus is gonna come in and make this easy. We'll show that here in just a minute. Um, sun requirements. This is what kind of, uh, uh, well, what kind of sun requirements that plant likes. So some plants like to be full sun and cannot tolerate being in, in the shade much. Uh, some plants are the complete opposite and like to be mostly in the shade and cannot tolerate full sun. And then you have some plants uh, that can kind of go uh, either way. So that's what the sun requirements field uh, is, is, is all about. Now, one thing that I want to mention here is on sun requirements, if you have a full sun area, there's things you can do to help those plants. So what we typically do are build shade walls. And we have a blog post that goes into detail about how the shade walls work. But what we do basically is on the west side of our bed, we put T-posts in the ground and then attach um, just shade cloth 
uh, to that to those t to those t posts. That was kind of the first iteration of it, and then the second uh, season that we started doing that, we switched it to instead of having shade cloth up on the t posts, we put hardware remesh panels. And we get those at, ho at Home Depot for like nine ten dollars, um, and we just zip tie those up to the t posts, and then we grow something up those trellises that do really well um in the heat and the and the and that will take over the the trellis so a couple things we've done for that are cucumber uh loofah plant if you're not familiar with a loofah plant these things are awesome Let me pull it up so this here uh, it the inside of the plant when it dries out is a loofah like you use in the shower it's the coolest thing it blew my mind the first time i saw these so we grow these on those uh, on those trellis walls a lot because they just will completely take over a wall. You'll get a ton of these, and um, and then you just kind of let them dry over the winter, and then they make great Christmas presents because they're pretty cool. Um, all right, let's jump back into spinach. So we have those shade walls we put on the west side of the bed. We do that with spinach a lot, and uh, really the spinach that does best for us is is planted on the east side of. Um, uh, of our storage shed so it gets shade in the afternoon and it does really well so there's a lot of different varieties of spinach if you come up to this types tab up here uh, we have all the different uh, types and, and varieties of spinach uh, we have an integration with burpee one of the largest seed companies in the country to pull in their database of all the varieties they have and then you can go through and see how many days of maturity and then a little description for each one so this is a nice way to kind of go and see uh, what all you know what all types of spinach are out there and then and you kind of know where to go from all right so let's go back over to details and um, water requirements so every plant is different when it comes to water as well so lettuce spinach kale they like getting a lot of water these leafy greens they, they go through a lot of water whereas something like uh, oregano or thyme comes from the desert and it does not like to get a lot of water so it, you can actually kill it if you give it too much water so every plant is different and that's what this water requirement section is for here um, fertilizing just like um, you know watering and sunlight every plant is different when it comes to how much fertilizer it needs so um, we have uh, a couple of different categories in here you have some plants that like to get a lot of nitrogen uh, nitrogen is the main food source for plants that's what produces the the green stuff on the plant and um, uh, like corn, uh, watermelon, there's a lot of plants that uh, take a lot, the, the, the need a lot of nitrogen. The easiest way and the best way we found to, 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 to get nitrogen on plants is to add some fish fertilizer. Um, it's basically just liquefied dead fish. Uh, it's gross, but it does the job and it's organic. Uh, we have an organic fertilizer in our store as well, so we just added this. Um, and this is made here in Oklahoma from a, an OSU um, uh, graduate that's been studying uh, all about this stuff. And, and he and I got together and talked about what we thought a perfect organic soil mix would look like. And, and this is basically it. So um, we're big believers in this stuff. Again, you can get it in our store. Um, every plant is going to be different when it comes to, to fertilizer. Make sure you check that out because some plants, like tomatoes, if you fertilize them at the wrong time, then they will stop producing fruit and just grow a bunch of greens. You've got to back off from nitrogen at a certain point. This is another area that Garden Plus is going to make it easier. So uh, we don't have the, the the we don't have this in there yet, but this is one of those things that we're working towards building is uh, telling you when to fertilize. Um, we feel like that's going to be something that's going to make it a lot easier to keep track of, of everything, really. Okay, so going down the list, we have. The more about spinach section so this shows you the mostly the planting information so some plants do well from seed um, some you really need to start indoors and then transplant tomatoes and peppers are typically that way because it takes a long time uh, for them to, to get going and uh, by the time if you were to start them outside by the time they get big enough uh, it's going to be too hot and then they're not going to produce fruit until after summer especially that's that's how it works in Oklahoma at least so um, so this this tells you the way that to, to plant that is whether through seed or transplant uh, the depth of how deep you plant the seed how many days it takes for it to sprout uh, how tall it's going to get this matters because uh, you got to factor in the sun so you don't want to put plants that are going to shade out other plants you got to really account for that uh, and then the family so uh, the reason why family is important is because you don't want to plant things that are the same family back to back in the same space 
And this is really going to come into play once we build out our, our garden mapping features that we want to get to, where we're going to help you kind of lay out your garden and we're going to use that family to know what you should have next to each other and, and all of that. Um, farther down, we have how to harvest each plant. So um, some plants, it's pretty obvious when to harvest, but other ones, it's a little more difficult to know. Like with watermelon, there's a specific kind of way you've got to know if it's, if it's ready to be harvested and we have all that kind of information in here. And then information about how to cook it and how to eat it. Again, it's sometimes it's obvious, but sometimes it's um, you grow something and you're like, well, what, what do I do now? Um, and then we have uh, recipes here. So Carrie is constantly adding new blog posts and recipes and videos and stuff in the app. So all those pull into here. Um, okay, so think, uh, okay, saving seeds. I need to cover that as well. So we have information here about saving seeds which has become pretty important lately. If you, if you look at a lot of the seed companies, they are sold out on a number of seeds. And uh, I, I saw that an article saying that Burpee had stopped taking orders a couple of days ago. Uh, and I, I just, there's just a lot of craziness going out there with seeds right now. So this is definitely one of those things to, to if you don't uh, do already, maybe to start thinking about doing is saving seeds for some of your favorite plants. So um, below that we have links to some of our favorite products. So these, are things that we have bought in our garden or the, that we use in our garden. We have a lot of smart pots in here. We have again our seeding square, the fertilizer, um, these growing systems here. These heavy duty trays are awesome if you're doing microgreens or anything like that. These heavy duty trays will last a very long time. It's a super thick plastic and I've been frustrated with breaking a lot of like trays and stuff like that. So I really, I really like these. We're hoping to carry these in our store really soon. These indoor grow lights are pretty cool. We have them for our aloe vera in our living room. So we just kind of have a little patch of aloe vera right there in the living room. And these lights make that possible. And then we've got a bunch of fertilizers and stuff like that. Um, our favorite knives. Again, everything we have in, in here are stuff that we use in our garden. So, or like our KitchenAid. We use that every single day. Okay, so let's look at the rest of the tabs that we have in here for spinach. So we have a friends tab. And this shows you all of the plants that grow well with spinach. So um, companion planting is basically the concept of grouping plants with plants that do well with them. So grouping plants that do well together, basically. And uh, that was one of the difficult things when we started growing food was trying to remember what all the things that can go next to each other and can't go next to each other. And it, so that's what this feature does is it makes it easy. So you can come in here and you can see these are all the friends of that plant. And then you can tap on them to go into it. Or over here, these are the enemies. So the things to avoid planting next to that. So this makes it really easy to keep track of that. And again, this is one of those things that we're going to be using with Garden Plus to, to when we do the mapping stuff to know what should go next to each thing and, and all of that. Okay, so now let's tap on the pest tab. And the pest tab shows you, um, well, obviously all the pests for spinach. So every plant has kind of its own unique set of pests that like to attack it so these are the ones for spinach and you can see pictures of both the larvae and the adult for them and if you tap on them then it gives you information about how to handle it organically so we don't use any uh, chemical pesticides or herbicides in, in our garden we like to use nature um, as it's intended basically so what i mean by that is with aphids our first year we bought a lot of ladybugs on amazon and then release them and then they went through and ate the aphids and then what we've learned to do over time is to encourage ladybugs to be here so we grow the kind of things they like to be around we um we make sure that we don't just you know we, we don't first of all we don't spray any any, chem, any chemical pesticides down so they don't you know we're not killing them um and, and we're, we're making an environment they want to be around so we have water we have things like that around for them um it also shows you which plants attack uh, or which plants are attacked by that pest because typically if that pest is on one of your plants then there's a high likelihood that it's going to be on one of your other plants so you can see which ones to go check on that and then we have uh, blog posts and all the stuff like that that is uh, about that specific pest so um, there's a whole lot of, of stuff that, of really cool ways that you can manage pests from uh, whether it's aphids with ladybugs or with uh, cabbage moths, just insect netting, you know, makes a big difference. Or this BT, which is a, uh, it's an organic treatment. It's a, it's a bacteria that they've 
uh, harvested that they uh, use put in water and then it, when caterpillars eat it it kills them again it's harmless for humans this is an organic treatment um, for rabbits you can use motion activated sprinklers there's just all these different ways that you can you can handle pests in your garden without having to spray chemicals down um, if you go to the more tab for that plant it will show you articles that are related to that plant and then uh, recipes for how to grow I mean how to eat with that plant I think we've already talked about that and then videos so these videos pull from our YouTube channel and anything related to spinach that we've we've posted comes into here so we've got all sorts of stuff whether it's Carrie and I at a home and garden show talking about it or us out in the garden with the kids planting or just we never know what our videos are going to be it's just random whatever we decide to make that day basically so I just threw a lot of words out there um, Carrie, are there any questions that I need to go over that have come up? There have been a lot of questions, but I think I'm I'm staying on top of it as much as I can. Um, so here's a really good one that okay. we've been talking about is how to start growing food from without having seeds and maybe just having grocery store access. So what are some foods? We talked about potatoes. Yeah. Great, great question. All right, so let's talk about things you could grow right now without having access to seeds just from sourcing from the grocery store. So potatoes already, that's great. So some potatoes have been sprayed to keep them from sprouting. So try and buy organic on all the things we're talking about. Try and find organic um, because those are not going to be sprayed with this stuff and that will really matter on potatoes. Um, sweet potatoes, it's too cold to plant them right now, but you can go ahead and buy the, the sweet potatoes and then... Um, I think we have a guide that talks about how to make the uh, the sprouts from them, which is basically you just put them in water, and then they'll form these little plants that come off just like kind of potato. Well, they're not they're different than potato sprouts; they look way different, but they work similarly. So you cut those off, and then they'll make new new plants from each one. Um, garlic is another thing. It's too late in the year really for garlic, but you could trick it. What I mean by that is garlic likes to go through a freeze cycle, so you can take it and put like a gallon sized baggie and fill it with soil and then put garlic in the middle of that soil and put it in the freezer for three weeks and then pull it out, put it outside, let it kind of de like defrost and then go plant that garlic and it thinks it went through winter. So you could do that with garlic. Um, if you are buying from like a lot of the natural grocers type places carry a lot of bulk supply of beans. So we've bought southern peas from there before. Um, pretty much any of the bulk organic beans should grow some sort of a bean. Um, and the cool thing about beans that blew my mind when I first started growing them, let's go to beans and let's start talking about beans a little bit. We're going to jump around and not really go in order of what the seasons are. Uh, we've got so many people in different places. I think it'd be hard for me to try and cover that. I'm just going to talk about specific plants. So beans are awesome. Um, the thing that blew my mind about beans was that the difference between like the dried beans that you buy from the store, like pinto beans and things like that, and a green bean is the age of the bean. Dried beans are just old green beans. That blew my mind. I think it's common sense to a lot of people, but that was just wow. So anyway, um, if you buy bulk dried beans, and I'm not talking about like bulk ones from Sam's Club or whatever, because a lot of those may have been some sprayed or whatever, like there's no telling. I'm talking about the ones that come from like bulk supply of like the big like things you can kind of you know pour out yourself from like natural grocers or something like that um so i think any of those would be a great thing to start with maybe corn the same way if you were able to find do they sell corn like that corn feed yeah because that's what like chickens and stuff eat they have corn mixed in so i think you could probably find corn that same way um so let's talk about some plants you may not want to do that with. So if you bought like a jalapeno from the store and there were seeds inside of that, you could try growing with it, but there's no telling what you're going to get because a lot of those, um, you know, tomatoes and jalapenos are, are hybrid varieties, which means that the seed that they produce is not always true to what the, to the parents that made them. So you might get a jalapeno that has extreme heat or that has no heat. You just, you really don't know what you're going to get on it. Now it's still better than nothing. So you know, if we're in a crisis situation, which obviously we are, or if we're in a situation where you can't get food, then go for it. Um, celery is kind of the same thing. You can kind of replant it, and it'll grow some cute little leaves. But you're not gonna, you're not gonna feed anyone off of off of regrown celery, I don't think. Um, 
Potatoes are really, that's the big one. I mean, potatoes got the iris through that. So I think they've been around for a long time helping us get through uh, disasters. So um, potatoes are probably the number one food I would go to right now. And that's what we did in our garden. We planted a ton of potatoes um, in like these big smart pots, the 10, well, from 5, 10, 15, 20. We did all the way up to 25. We're doing an experiment to see how well they do in each size. And we're moving next week, so it makes it easy for us just to move all those with us. And then we wanted to have a bunch of food on hand because you never know what's going to happen. And um, so, so yeah, I think potatoes are a great choice. Um, what else are we, are we forgetting? It might be... Avocado. Avocado, yeah, it's going to take you a while, though. Um, you know, and kind of along that note, too, we have a blog post that goes into detail about how we cook our bulk source of of rice and beans and stuff like that too because pretty much the way that our diet works whenever we're trying to live off our garden is we buy rice and beans uh, in bulk started buying beans in bulk less and less because we're growing more of them um, and then we we have like a whole chicken that we make in an instapot and we make a bunch of broth off of that and then um, we mix in vegetables from our garden and make a bunch of stir fries and wraps basically just using those ingredients um, and we use a lot of herbs like oregano and rosemary and and things like that too so we have a blog post that really goes into detail on, on how we do all of that but so let's talk more about beans and let's actually start by talking about peas because they're related and there's this whole kind of workflow that you go through workflow um, what's the right word here timeline if you will so um, peas and beans are awesome for a number of reasons number one they are able to take nitrogen out of the air and put it into the soil, which is a pretty rare thing for plants to be able to do. And it's a pretty important thing because nitrogen is their food source. So they can make their own food. And what happens is the plants that are next to them or that fall behind them in the same planting space reap the benefit of that as well because they're able to access the nitrogen that's left behind. So peas and beans are great to have around your garden because they help your other plants. Um, but also they taste amazing. So peas fresh out of the garden taste way better than anything that you're gonna that you've ever had. If you haven't had a pea that was picked within the past two hours, then you have not had a pea before. Sorry, I'm I'm that's my stand. <laughs> <laughs> that's my rock I'm standing on. So um, they just they, they lose their taste in a hurry once they've been harvested, and it's it's the taste that you cannot match, and it basically tastes like candy. It is so good. They are so good. Um, we're we love peas, and peas are really easy to grow. They climb on their own, so we plant them next to some sort of a fence or a trellis, and they will just climb up and start producing a ton of peas and just continue producing until it gets too hot. And that is why you have to have beans that follow peas soon after. So we're typically planting either peas or beans every two weeks from the time we start planting until the time we call it quits for the year. Well, and I guess we stop around mid-September is when we stop planting, but we have this order that we go in. So we start with peas, and then once the peas are done and it's too hot then we switch to beans and then we keep growing beans until it gets too hot for speaking of too hot it's getting hot in here I'm turning my fan on hopefully that doesn't mess up the audio if y'all hear like a hum or something let me know I can turn it off um, so we start with peas and then we go into beans when it gets too hot for the beans then we switch to southern peas because southern peas really tolerate the heat we basically have this cycle going all throughout the year we're after southern peas we come back down into regular beans and then we go back down into peas again. So, um, again, you can see planting dates that are calculated for where you live if you go in here and check this out. Um, and we can see all the information about how to grow them in here. So I'm not gonna go into too much detail on, on each one there. Um, southern peas, if you aren't familiar with those, uh, again, they're just black eyed peas. So they do really well in the summer. Um, we have them, they're, they're thriving them. Okra and basil are the plants that make you happy in the summer when everything else makes you feel like a miserable miserable gardener. At least that's the way it is in Oklahoma. Okay, so let's start talking about more things you can grow. Um, so we have not talked much at all about fruit. So let's talk about like berries and, and fruit trees and things like that. So let's start with fruit trees. The easiest fruit tree to start with is going to be an apple. Um, it should be fine to plant apples right now in most places maybe not if you're down in southern texas it's probably going to be too hot here soon and that's the thing you need to consider is that they need to have their roots well established before it gets really hot so that's the biggest thing you need to think about as far as when when you're planting your apple tree 
Um, it's a great time to plant it in the fall as well. They do really well being planted in the fall. Um, apples and pears are the easiest to grow out of the fruit trees. Uh, peaches are harder. Cherries are harder than that. Um, but, I mean, it, it really depends on where you live, too. I'm saying this based off of being in Oklahoma. If you're somewhere else, then peaches, if you're in Georgia, then peaches grow really well. So, it really just depends on, on where you live. As far as berries are concerned, um, again, in Oklahoma, blackberries are the easiest berries to grow. Um, they're probably going to be pretty easy to grow most everywhere, though. They're, they're native to North America, and they grow really well here. Um, uh, strawberries are also really easy to grow. Um, we're big fans of strawberries. What we typically do with strawberries is we plant one of the big bag beds, like an entire one full of strawberries, and they will go through and make more strawberries and, and just take over. Um, they are so sweet out of the garden. It's kind of like peas, where if you haven't had one straight out of the garden, it's just, they're so different. It tastes like there's sugar in it. I mean, there is sugar in it, but it tastes like there's extra sugar in it. They are so sweet. Our kids love them so much. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay, so uh, raspberries are also pretty easy to grow. Um, i trying to think of any berries that aren't easy to grow. The big, berries? Yeah, blueberries are the biggest thing, or probably the one that have the biggest uh, wrinkle. So with blueberries, it's important to make sure that you adjust the soil to be a little more acidic. With most plants, if you're following the Mel's mix, you really don't have to worry about uh, soil, like pH and all that, but blueberries you do. And you need to buy this soil acidifier here and then follow the directions on it and add it in to, uh, to wherever you're planting. I really recommend a smart pot for the blueberries because it makes it easier to adjust the soil in just that smart pot instead of having to adjust the, so the, the pH in the, in the soil in the ground because the soil in the ground is gonna be changing constantly from new inputs coming into it. Whereas if you have your container, then you can, con you can control the pH a little easier. Okay, so we have pests for strawberries and elderberry. Okay, um, off the top of my head, we don't get a lot of, straw of pests on our strawberries. Um, we really don't have any issues. I guess the biggest issue we have on strawberries are mice. Yes, those dang mice. So, um, the way that we handle mice is by getting cats. <laughs> That's really the best way that we have handled mice. Cats. Is we have three cats and we have three dogs. And it's hard to keep track of the time. So they pretty much handle the mice for us. Um... Yeah, there's other uh, ways in, in our in our app about how to handle mice, but that's the biggest issue that we've had with strawberries. We really haven't had much insect pressure, haven't had the fruit worms at all. Um, we don't have to deal with squirrels or anything. They would definitely be an issue. Birds. Birds are an issue in strawberries. You can do bird netting. Um, so we have a trellis over top of ours. So kind yeah, of it kind of hides them. Mm -hmm. And the cats, you know, the birds are kind of scared to go over there anyway. So don't have a lot of issues with, with strawberry pests. Um, fruit is pretty easy to grow. Like these berries are generally pretty, pretty easy to grow, and like especially the blackberries. We planted three, four years ago, and now we've got I don't even know how many. They're everywhere. They've kind of spread on their own. Okay, so any more questions, or may I jump into some more plants? Elderberry. Elderberry. Okay. Do we have it in here? We do. Awesome. Sorry for dabbing. I know. My goodness. <laughs> Um, elderberry. So elderberry is really easy to grow. We planted it's a perennial. We planted it outside of our kitchen window and it makes these beautiful flowers. Um, the thing about elderberry is you cannot eat the berries. Um, you have to process them first. Um, but there's a lot of stuff out there showing that it has been proven to help with flu and colds and all that. Um, make sure you do the research on it. Uh, it's one of those things you do not want to just haphazardly just start using without understanding uh, how it works and all that. So, um, yeah. Question? So if you want to talk more about pests, we have lots of questions about dog pests, cat pests, about okay. how we keep them out of the garden, and yes. also squash bugs. So the cats. Um, okay, so the biggest way that we handle our cats is through these motion-activated sprinklers, moving them around, where cats really don't mess with our beds that already have plants in them. They're only messing with our beds that are empty, or that we just put seeds in. So what we do is when we first put seeds down, we'll put this motion activated sprinkler down there, and then that will uh, that will pretty much keep the cats away, and it'll shoot me in the face like three times a day, because I forget it's there. <laughs> so it has double benefit. It, it's pretty great. <laughs> <laughs> it's always like cold, because it's early spring where we're doing this. I get shot in the face with the sprinkler. So um, 
So just remember it's out there, but it works really well. So I, I can attest to it. Um, cat repellent, things like that. Um, also, we just keep, like, you can put a litter box um, that's in a place where they like to go. And that will sometimes prevent them from going in your raised beds as well. Uh, we really haven't had a ton of issues with our cats going in our raised beds once we start growing food. It's more of an issue in the winter. Another thing you can do to help with that is cover the raised beds when you're not using them with burlap and then those remesh panels on top of that. That'll keep the cats out of it as well. Um, dogs? We don't have dogs in here. Oh wow. my goodness. I, got, I better get busy. I don't know. So dogs, we built a fence to keep our dogs out. Mm -hmm. um, we have tried every like garlic, pepper, onion, spray, repellent. We've made them. We've done all of that kind of stuff. And our dogs just think it's flavoring, really. Uh, it doesn't really keep them out. So we built a fence and keep them out that way. And we gave them a sand pit to play in. And that generally keeps them out too. So don't have a lot of great answers on dogs and cats. What other pests have they asked about? Squash bugs. Squash bugs. Okay, squash bugs are the most difficult pest to control in your garden. So the thing about squash bugs, it's all about early detection and getting them squashed <laughs> <laughs> like uh, before, um, before they get established. So you've got to look for these eggs that are under the leaves. And as soon as you see them... Um, I hire my children to start keeping patrol and I pay them a quarter for every squash bug that they find. And that generally keeps them away until we go on vacation in the summer and we come back and then and then the squash bugs have taken over. So um, even if you did try and spray pesticide down, it's typically not going to really affect squash bugs because they've got this hard exoskeleton and it's difficult to, an adult squash bug especially, to kill them. We have used diatomaceous earth around the base of squash plants. Um, we're going to... We, we, we got some new stuff too. Some... Uh, what's it called? Frog repellent? Remember the stuff? Oh. Can you give me that bag down there please? I'll, I'll show what I got. So we, my mom called me the other day because she saw this on Shark Tank. And she wanted me to try this uh, first Saturday line. So it's like... It's, it's, I've been reading into it. It's all organic. It seems to be very close to diatomaceous earth except it doesn't cake up when it rains. So, we are uh, excited to try that out. It's made here in Oklahoma, so that's one of the main reasons why I wanted to try it. And um, I read up on it, and it seemed like it was good stuff. So we're going to try that around the base of squash plants as well. Um, netting, too. You can put insect netting over your squash plants until they start to produce fruit or flowers. Once you get the first female flower, um, you can know because there's a little, like, baby-looking fruit at the base of the flower. Um, that's one of the females. Whenever you get one of those, then you have to take the netting off. Um, another thing you can do to really help with squash bugs is to grow your squash vertically. So whenever you grow it to where it's down on the ground, it um, it's really easy for the squash bugs to hide underneath of the leaves and to do all that. Um, whereas when you grow them vertically, like you attach it to a T-post and kind of tie it as it goes up, then it's easier for both you or your kids or uh, a bird to see the squash bugs and, and to help you out with it. So those are the best tips we have for how to handle squash bugs. Um, if you know of anything else, I feel like we've got to have some innovation in the squash bug department. <laughs> I feel like something has got to, we've got to figure something well, out. Well, we try to give them to our, to the Nellies. We do. We feed our spiders. So we have a bunch of orb weaver. So if you go to the beneficials, you can see, um, helpful things in your garden. And these orb weavers. Uh oh. Our son just came in here screaming that there's a bird in the house. It's always an adventure. It's always an adventure in here. There's a bird in the house, apparently. Apparently the birds heard us talking about them and have come in to attack. Okay. <laughs> I don't know if I need to go help them or what. I don't hear any chaos. I'm guessing one of the cats. So this is the problem with the cats is sometimes they'll bring in a bird or a mouse or all sorts of treats for us. So let's keep talking about spiders. So we have a bunch of pet spiders, if you will, out in the garden. They're orb weavers and we will feed them like our squash bugs we capture. But, you know, there's a bunch of, uh, of beneficial insects you can have in your garden to help with all this too. So praying mantises, um, you know, lizards aren't insects, but they're beneficial. There's a lot of beneficial things you can have in your garden. And in this tab, it'll go through 
and uh, you can see how to encourage how to encourage them in your garden. And some of these can be beneficial or can be pests. Like ants can be considered really both because they do help your garden, but they can be a pest. So when you tap on here, then you can you can kind of see. Um, let me go over to the pest and tap on ants. And you can see you know the different ways you can handle with them, or if you go to beneficials, it'll show you why they're why they're helpful. Sorry, I'm so distracted by this bird situation. I just I gotta know what's going on. I'm not hearing any chaos. So I think I think we're okay. But I'm very distracted. Okay, so let's jump back and talk about I'm gonna start talking about some more plants. I cannot see your, your questions or anything right now because I don't have the chat. Um, Carrie was was manning the chat and it's it's over here. So I'm gonna keep going through and just talking about some plants. So let's talk about peppers. So one question we get a lot is like to for jalapenos, like where that is in the app or something like that. So I want to show that if you search for a specific plant, it's going to show you uh, the plants that match up with that. So we don't have like an individual um, plant for jalapenos because that's just a variety of hot pepper. And there's a lot of different varieties of hot peppers. Like if I go into hot peppers and I go to types, like each one of these are a different variety so it, it, it wouldn't be it'd be overwhelming if we had a plant for each one of these so we group them together you know into into these so we have for peppers we'll have a couple different types of peppers we've got you know banana peppers bell peppers hot peppers or sweet peppers and these are kind of just the, the categories we have in these and these plants are grown very similarly you're crying Sorry, like I said, we have four kids. It's chaos around here. It's hard to do these live streams. We're hoping eight o'clock will be safe, but a bird came in to prove otherwise. <laughs> okay, so um, hot peppers. This is one of those things I mentioned earlier, best started indoors and then transplanted outside once it gets uh, to be the right temperature for it. So we've got a little grow light set up in our office right here that we start our plants in and um and then we transplant them outside um i also like buying my tomatoes and uh, peppers from the farmer's market so i found them to be plants that are typically super healthy that are grown by somebody that's been growing tomatoes or peppers in oklahoma for basically as long as i've been alive that knows a lot about them and their plants have been taken care of really well so I, I really like to buy my plants from farmers markets for a number of reasons you know for one i think you're getting better plants two you're supporting your local community which we're seeing how important that is right now um and, and three you're helping somebody out through that because you know that if you go to one of these big box stores and buy plants they're, they're not going to see the impact of that but if you go buy a whole tray of tomatoes from someone at the farmer's market, you made their day and it's a cool experience to be able to do that. So um, anyway, that's typically where I buy my plants from, my, uh, my transplants, if I'm not starting them here. Um, we'll start a lot of them here, but I like, I'm a collector of sorts. The same kind of energy I put into collecting football cards as a kid goes into collecting plants now. So whether that's like oregano or sage or basil or like the different varieties of those. I just, I, we like to grow just a bunch of different types of stuff and that, that includes peppers too. So I've talked about herbs a lot, but I really haven't gone into detail on any of them now. So let's go ahead and talk about some of those. So oregano is probably the easiest herb to start with. It is uh, very easy to grow. It's a great companion plant that helps with uh, pretty much every other plant in your garden. It um, has a ton of, nu of nutritional benefits. It helps with immune support. Uh, you can feed it to your dogs too. You can add it to their dog food and it really helps them out. Um, oregano is just an awesome plant. There's a couple different varieties. There's uh, Italian, there's Greek oregano, and then there's just, uh, and then there's spicy oregano as well. Um, they all have their own distinct flavors. Um, but we're big, big fans of oregano. We grow quite a bit of it and we include it in a lot of different dishes. Again, if you're curious how to cook with it, you can go into the recipes tab, and we have different recipes that show you know, like how, how we use each plant. Um, rosemary grows very similar to oregano. Um, it likes the same kind of conditions where it doesn't like to be, um, it doesn't like to have a lot of water um, all the time, or it can, it can drown, if you will, it just doesn't really do well with that. Um, 
It also doesn't need a lot of fertilizer or anything like that. We're typically planting our rosemary and oregano in like its own smart pot. And then what we do is we leave it outside, you know, pretty much every day throughout the year, except in Oklahoma, we tend to have some pretty crazy temperature swings where in January, sometimes February, we'll have one day that's 80 and the next day will be five degrees and then we'll kind of yo-yo back and forth so when, whenever we have those wild temperature swings we'll bring the plants indoors during that but if it's just kind of a gradual cool down um then we'll just leave them out and and just let them they do fine and then they'll kind of go dormant through the winter and then come back in the spring um okay so let's look through and see what else we haven't talked about um, we talked about potatoes a little bit, but we didn't necessarily talk about how to plant them. Um, we Potatoes are one thing that I, we pretty much only grow exclusively in these big smart pots because it makes it a lot easier to harvest them. So if you grow them in a raised bed, you've got to go through and dig them out and uh, make sure you don't break one in the process. But if you have a smart pot, then you can kind of just dump that out on the ground and then go through... And the kids love to go through like it's an Easter egg hunt, basically, and they're going through looking for potatoes. Um, okay, let me see what else we should talk about. I think I've gone over the time we said we were going to go, but that's all right. I certainly don't have anywhere to go. Um, broccoli. We haven't talked about broccoli yet. Let's talk about that. So... And we haven't talked about Garden Plus, so we'll go back and talk about that in a second, too. So, broccoli, whenever we first started growing food, my idea of broccoli was that it was, you know, what I'd seen from the grocery store. So, like, a big tree-looking head, and that was what I had to grow. But the thing about broccoli is that there are a lot of varieties that grow a bunch of small side shoots instead that look kind of like that. And we much prefer... To, to grow these instead because for a couple reasons one look at the dates of maturity It's like 50 to 60 days for these and you start getting broccoli Whereas some of these other ones it can take, you know, like here's a hundred I don't think that's the right day enough, But there's some of these are like 90 days for, for some of these broccoli plants and um, So so anyway, we, I really like growing those sprouting broccoli because you can eat the entire broccoli plant the entire thing is edible um Let's also talk about cabbage because cabbage is another one of those things where uh, it grows you plant it around the same time as, as broccoli. Um, we've switched away from growing like big cabbage heads and now we do more of like the bok choy and the leaf cabbage uh, for, a set, for a similar reason why we do um, the, the broccoli with sprouting varieties. That way we get a bunch of leaves instead of just you know one big head that we harvest. Okay, so we've talked about a lot of plans. I think there's a lot more I, I could cover. I'm sure we'll be doing more of these live streams. Uh, I want to go ahead and talk about Garden Plus, though, and talk about what we just released. So uh, we've been working on this for a year and a half. Um, if, if, you, if you don't know or if, if you just joined, so uh, my wife and I started this app. Um, we have a couple of friends that help us with this, but this is a, a side project for us. We, we all have full-time jobs. Um, three of us are software developers full-time, and then uh, Carrie teaches nursing at, at OU um, full-time as well. So um, we've been building this kind of uh, nights, weekends. Uh, it's been a long, hard road, and we're very excited to, to, to have this out. So um, Garden Plus is now out in a free preview, and let me go through and show you uh, what you can do with it. So if you come in here and set up a test account, so I'm going to set up a test account. Okay, so you can register your account, and now you have access to Garden Plus, where you can add plants from your garden into Garden Plus. So, I'm going to add a plant to garden, and I'm going to add spinach, and I click on spinach, and now I can choose the starting method that I did. So I'm going to do outdoor seed, amount planted, I'm going to do four squares, location, purple smart pot and type uh, we'll do Bloomsdale if if what we if we don't have what you're growing in this list you can um, you can come in here and you can type your own so you can enter uh, I'm just going to type test spinach here and then enter that and then now we've got test spinach 
So from now here, from here, it's going to tell you when you should expect that seed to sprout. So this will tell you kind of when you should expect uh, the plant to pop up. And then once you see it, you can tap on this mark of sprouted and then you can create an event for it. And now if you go in the plant log, you can see that you have the sprouted event that we just created for spinach. So also it'll show you when the projected first harvest is for spinach. And whenever you first get that harvest window, you can tap on at harvest amount. But I have to say that Carrie is back. We have to have, so what happened Hello? with the bird situation? Can you please update I, us? I don't know how a bird got into the house, but yeah, the kids were freaked out. But it was just a regular bird. It's dark outside. So what did okay. you do with the bird? Did you get rid of it? Uh, no, I, I tried to lead it out of the door with the broom. Did it work? It was talent. I think so, because I can't find it now, at least, because I turned my back and I was like, I think it went out the back door. I don't hear it and I don't see it. So, so you gonna, lost the bird. I am going to say that it is outside. <laughs> <laughs> Fingers crossed. Does it attack my face in the middle of the night? That's happened before. So, yeah. That's happened before where our, it was a two or three. <laughs> He yells, flying squirrel! We're like, what? And then there the bird comes flying at Carrie's face because he thought it was a flying squirrel. He calls mice squirrels. Yeah. So, okay. sorry about that, guys. I kind of lost the, the chat. So. Uh, it's okay. I kept it going, I think. I was rattled, for sure. I kept I kept hearing things and I didn't know. Like, should I get up and come check on you? Like, it, you never know what's Has this bird overtaken the household? Was it a falcon? I have a lot of questions. I didn't know what was happening. You see, this is live entertainment here. <laughs> Welcome to our live show. Oh, man. Okay, so I was just showing Garden Plus. We just showed uh, adding a, sprout, a sprouted event. Are there questions that I need to come back and answer? I don't know. I'm just now looking. Okay. So. Okay, I'll let you catch up on that. Let me know if you see any. So I'm going to keep talking about Garden Plus. So... In plant log, you can come in here, you can add other events too. So sprouted is what we had there, kind of guiding you through, but you can come in here, you can add that you watered. So you can keep track of that. We're gonna have reminders that um, tell you when to water and keep track of this. So that's one of the things that's coming soon as well. Um, uh, fertilize too, you can come in here, mark what you fertilize. So fish fertilizer and save that. And you can come in here if there's a pest and you can log what pest it was that you saw. So you get the idea. You can keep track of everything that happens with your garden plant right here. And then in plant notes, you can come in here, you can enter notes. And you can add a photo. Let's not get the journey. <laughs> and there you go. And then once you take a photo, it'll change that image for that plant to the photo you took. So if I come back into my plant list now, I can see spinach, which is me. Maybe I don't want it to be me. I want it to be spinach. So now I can switch it back there in this change plant picture that I use there. So let's go back into Garden Plus into the spinach plant and look at it. Um, you can also tap on the growing guide from here. So if you want to learn more about growing spinach from within here, you can tap on this growing guide. It takes you into there. And um, so say that the spinach is done now and I'm ready to, to get out of my garden. I can come in here, I can archive it, and now it'll be in my archive. So I can come back in here and search for it later. So maybe next year I want to see uh, what variety of spinach was it that I, that I grew. I can come in here, I can look at it, I can look at all the logs for it, I can see what bugs attacked it, and, and all that kind of stuff as well. And then also there's garden notes for your overall garden. You can come in here and you can enter garden notes. So. Uh, again, this is going to be in a free preview. Um, we don't know how long it's going to be a free preview for. Our initial plan before everything um, flipped upside down in the world was to make it free for April. But we're going to we're going to leave it free until it feels right not to not to do that. And I'm not sure when that's going to be. Um, we've had people ask how much it's going to be. Again, we're we're not 100% sure on that either. Uh, it's definitely going to be less than a packet of seeds per month. That is the standard that we are going to stay at for sure. Now, where that is under there, I'm not sure. I mean, um, like I said, right now, we this is like a thing that we do at nights and weekends. 
in order to build the kind of things we want to build, the, the mapping features, the push notifications, all this big infrastructure that we're getting into now, we need to be able to hire people to work on this full time. Um, I mean, just the support messages alone, we get, I don't even know how many emails a day. And I'm not complaining. I, we appreciate the emails. We really do. It is a lot, though. It's hundreds of emails a day. And right now it is Carrie and I um, and Justin and Patrick handling, handling you know, every email. So we, we, we've got to get to the point where we can start, you know, hiring people to help out. We've had people that have volunteered to help us. And I think we're going to start letting people help us, you know, thank you to, to people that have, that have offered. But we would like to be able to pay people for their time and to and to make something out of this that, you know, that is sustainable because um, right now we are happy to spend our nights and weekends working on this. We feel like it is our mission and our purpose. Um, and we'd like to be able to do this long term sustainably. And um, so anyway, if you'd like to support us, um, you can shop from our store. Uh, if you clack, if you clack, <laughs> if you quack, if you click, it's getting light. <laughs> If you click on this icon up here, it'll show you all the different products we have. You can support us by shopping from our store. If we don't have an item in our store, you can buy it on Amazon, and it will uh, a, per, a, a portion of that from our link will, will go to us. And then once Garden Plus is out, then um, sign up for for a premium account. We'll, um, and, and that'll obviously help us as well. Um, yeah. So I, hopefully that answers a number of the questions we've gotten about Garden Plus and all of that. Um, Again, this is not, like, we're not doing this to make money. This is not why we started from Seed to Spoon. We started this because we wanted to make it easy for other people to grow food like we had learned how to do. And it started as a YouTube channel, and then as a blog, and then we learned how to code, and then we built this app. And now here we are live streaming to the internet about about growing food at 9.22 on a Tuesday, <laughs> which was not our plan five years ago at all. But here we are, and we're thankful to be here. So, um... Okay, what have I not talked about? Um, I'm gonna show a couple other things in the app. In this videos tab, you can see all of our YouTube videos. So if you wanna see more from our garden, come in here and, okay, there we go. And you can see <laughs> all of my failed live streams that I tried to do, <laughs> it didn't work there. Uh, okay, but if you scroll down more, you can see you know videos we've made about how to use the app, You know videos directly from our garden, um, interviews with friends that want to start growing food, uh, videos of, of us out, um, videos of bunnies. There's all sorts of random stuff we've got on our YouTube. If you come over here, you can see our popular videos, um, the ones people have watched the most, um, and articles. Again, we've got our Getting Started tab, and we've got our most recent articles in here. Carrie has new stuff coming out every other day, pretty much, about how to do all different all different types of things. We um, podcast episodes are on all that kind of thing is, is in here um so i have talked a lot uh, i know there's some more plants i can cover i'm happy to go into those looking around to see if there's anything else i should cover are there any other questions that have come up that you've seen okay um so let's talk about a few more plants and then we'll finish this off so i think we'll shoot to finish at 9 30 i'll only be 30 minutes over so that's not too bad. Let's talk about carrots because we've not talked about any of the like root crops yet. So carrots are um, easy to grow once they sprout, but they take some patience to get sprouted because they need to stay watered for sometimes up to 21 days while they germinate. So if you go down and look at the days of sprout, it's 6 to 20. I said 21. Um, so you have to keep it moist that entire time. So that's the challenge with carrots. Um, beets, you have to make sure that you thin, uh, thin them down because one beet seed has multiple beets in it, so it's going to grow a bunch together. You got to make sure you thin them down or they are not going to do well. Um, radish are really easy to grow and you'll get them in like 20 to 30 days, I guess 30 days, 28 to 30. Um, we don't love the way they taste, but they're great to, they're, they're great starter plant because you're going to have success, and those key early victories are important in growing food because it gives you confidence. Okay, let me, let me look through and see if there's anything else that I should cover. I think we've talked about enough. I haven't really talked about watermelon and cantaloupe, um, cucumber. Those are all similarly grown as well. We got a cucumber tip on that. So cucumber, 
Um, really likes the heat as well as watermelon and cantaloupe. Uh, they do not like cold at all, so you've got to wait until it gets above 55 at night to, to plant them outside. Um, there's a there's a lot of different varieties of cucumbers. So there's pickling varieties that um, that you know make the right size ones for pickles. There's ones that are better for juicing. Um, for watermelon, there's big watermelons, obviously, like you buy at the store, but we like to grow the small ones that are like this big and that are individually sized. Um, you get a lot more out of those, and it's just they're easier to grow. Okay, do we have a question? Yeah, this, I thought this was a good one. So what vegetables are good to grow for school gardens, um, elementary school? Great question. So elementary school garden. So I would do radish because, again, they're like 30 days and kids have short attention spans and they're going to see it growing in a hurry. So I think radish would be a good would be a good thing to do from seed. It'll also teach them how seeds work. Um, I would also do lettuce from a transplant um, because it's going to grow fast and they're going to see new leaves coming up. So I, I think lettuce from a transplant would be a good option as well. I would do a pea or a bean because um, it's really easy to see kind of what's going on with that seed as it grows with a pea or a bean and it has very distinct features and i think it's a, it's a great way for kids to kind of experience um, seeds um, i would probably do an herb as well because I, th I think it's super important to get introduced to herbs at an early age because they have a bunch of medicinal benefits and um and i think once you acquire that taste for it early on it can help out so i think something like maybe a basil and then um basil or maybe oregano chives i think would be great for kids too because they have a very mild onion flavor we haven't talked about chives let's talk about those real fast so chives are um very similar to onions so the difference between chives and onions onions are you grow them for the bulbs so that's the main reason why you're growing onions chives you're growing them for the tops and chives are perennial and come back year after year so Chives are also awesome because they make these uh, these flowers and the flowers are edible and kids are fascinated about being able to eat a flower and they taste really good. So I think that's a good mix of stuff to start for a school car, a school garden with kids. Um, if you have room outside and if you're in the right climate for it, okra is very easy to grow. So I think it's one of those things that might be good to grow too. And, it, and it, it's big. Kind of with that in mind too, there's a 12 foot tall sunflower called a Russian mammoth. Kids are fascinated by that. I'm fascinated by it because it's a giant sunflower. Those are cool. Um, yeah, I think those are some good things to start with the, with an elementary garden. Do we have any other questions? Um, yes, what's best to plant in raised garden, smart pots, and also onions? So what's best to plant in a smart pot? You can plant anything in a smart pot. I mean, we haven't had anything that has not done well in a smart pot. Now, some do better in different types of smart pots so the big bag beds that are wide and only like a foot tall maybe like 16 inches 18 inches tall those are great for potatoes and onions and things like that that um or, or other plants that don't require like a ton of root depth whereas like the the taller 20 gallon smart pots are better for like tomatoes and peppers so it really just depends and again if you tap on the plant then it'll give you the right size smart pot for uh for that plant but really, there isn't anything we, we've grown that hasn't done well in a smart pot. I guess maybe, no, you may have to trellis something a little bit more than it, than if it was in the ground just because of the whole height difference and it falling over. But I really can't think of anything. Any other questions? We're at 929, so. Uh, just onions. Just onions. In general. Yeah, so onions um, are typically started early in the season. Um, in February and the way that uh, most people do onions is through these little sets so if you buy them in these sets of 25 to 50 onions that are little baby onion plants that have been pulled out of the ground and bundled together and then when you transplant them they keep growing so we have uh, some videos that show our um, our daughter going through and planting them and uh, <laughs> junior when he was little look at that little guy um, so you know, it's just one of those things that's really great for kids to plant too. Uh, our kids are typically the ones going through and planting our onions because I don't have the patience to make a little hole and put them in every two inches. I just, I get, I don't like it. But they do. They love it. So, um, one thing to consider on onions is go to your local nursery to buy them because it matters where you live with onions. What I mean by that is your latitude. 
So some onions are what are called long day onions, where they like the sun to be out longer. Some are short day, where they like the, the sun to not have as much sun. Um, so it really matters where you live on that. So I would get I would get onions from a local nursery because they're going to carry ones that are that are good for where you live. Is there any particular app for telling you where the sun will be in the sky? I don't know. Um, yeah, I don't know if there's an app for helping with sun position. I'm sure there's one out there. Um, what we did was we kind of just uh, looked at, we just went out and took pictures every month or so. There was that sunlight area. calculator that we got too from yeah. Amazon. Yeah, we bought a sunlight calculator on Amazon, but I think it wasn't waterproof or something ridiculous. So then it rained and it got ruined or it, we didn't have great success with that. Um, yeah, I'm sorry. I don't have a great recommendation on that. And then just to wrap it up, I did answer this in the chat, but a lot of people probably have this question. So with the free Garden Plus, if they put all their garden info in... Yes. Yes. So it's not everything you enter in Garden Plus is yours forever. You're going to be able to access that. Um, any plant you enter, you're going to be able to access. Whenever it becomes a paid version, you just won't be able to add new plants into your garden. But everything you've entered is yours. I would not do that to you. That'd be evil. Or not going to be mean. Um... So yeah, hopefully that answers, answers that question. Cool. Well, thank you everyone for joining us. Um, I, I think we're probably going to keep doing these as long as there's interest. So if there's, if there's questions that you have afterwards when you're watching this, leave a comment and we'll come through on the next video and answer them. So I'm not sure when we're going to do another one of these. It really just depends on when these babies are not going to be yelling or crying at us. Um, we timed it well tonight, so, well, for the Except most part, the bird. till the bird. <laughs> so, anyway, uh, thank you everyone for watching. Uh, we appreciate everyone that has downloaded the app and told your friends about it. We released this in 2018, having no idea what to expect. Um, just kind of like, well, let's just put out an app and just see what happens. And it seems like overnight um things have changed and it's just it's amazing and, and we really appreciate everyone out there that is that has reached out and told us that they've used our app and it's helped them or that uh you know it's just it's just awesome and um if there's anything that we can do to make that better uh you can reach us through the app through this little question mark here and that will send an email or it'll take you to a page where you can you can find out more information about the app and you can send us feature requests and all that kind of stuff. So, um, until next time, we'll see you again. Thanks. Bye, Bye everybody.